for moles of I minus. So if we were to draw, you were not asked to do this, but one way of looking at it is by looking at this concentration versus time graph. So if we were to plot the concentration of iodide versus time, what would this graph look like for the iodine clock reaction? So is the concentration increasing or decreasing or staying the same? Okay, now note that iodide is a product of this reaction. So that means that the iodide should be increasing. So the graph is going to look something like this. So really, at one second, so this is T equals one second. We want to figure out what that concentration is at T equals one second. Okay, so that concentration may change if we change the conditions of the experiment. So. In the first step, it says, uh, what would be the probable effect on the number of moles of I minus if each of the following changes were made in initial conditions? So if you use a two liter container that's completely filled with water, you replace the one liter container, note that what happens, what variable is changing by using the larger container with more solvent? Yes, yeah, so the concentration changes is increase or decrease? So the concentration is, okay, so for number one, the concentration is increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. Yes, decreasing. So if it decreases, what happens to the rate? Does the rate increase or decrease? Decreasing. Yeah, it actually decreases, which means that what happens to the amount of I minus which is formed? Will it be the same as with one liter, larger or smaller? It should be smaller, so that means that the amount of moles of I minus should decrease. Okay, part two, you lower the temperature of the reaction, so if you lower the temperature, what happens to the rate when temperature drops? So the rate's going to a decrease, which means that if the rate decreases, what happens to the moles of I minus? Yes, that's also going to decrease. Okay, let's go to question two. Which change from part A, one or two, change the rate constant of the reaction? So, if we change the concentration, and keep the temperature the same, the rate constant K stays the same. However, when we change the temperature, that should change the rate constant of the reaction. And that's because of this equation, K is equal to A times E to the minus EA over RT. This is the Arrhenius equation. Note that as the temperature changes, the rate constant K is going to change too. Okay, so change the temperature, that changes the rate constant. Part C, you want the iodine clock reaction to turn blue in 45 seconds. Identify the reaction conditions which will make it turn blue in 45 seconds. Now I know the 11 to 2 lab get, didn't get to this part of the lab in, in lab 2, and I think the 2 to 5 lab actually did, so there may have been an advantage for the two to five lab and for this question over the 11 to two lab. So if there was an advantage, I apologize for any advantage that the two to five lab had over the 11 to two lab. Although I didn't, I didn't quantify whether there was an advantage on, the on this question on the exam or not, so. Uh, okay, so for this one, note that the rate is equal to the change in the IO3 minus concentration with respect to time, and that's equal to rate constant K times IO3 minus to the first power times HSO3 minus to the first power. Now note in lab, the way we do the calculation is that when we started with a point, okay, so we said that IO3 minus 
before mixing was 0 0.02 molar and HSO3 minus was 0 0.002 molar. And based on these amounts, the IO3 minus or the change in IO3 minus, this was 0 0.00033 molar. You wanted to make the solution turn blue in 45 seconds, therefore delta T is going to be 45 seconds. You're given the rate cost in K, and that was 0.6 inverse molar inverse second, so K is 0 0.60. Then it also says here, uh, it gave you the IO. The IO3 minus and the HS3 minus again, so I gave you that already. So there's a few ways to answer this question. So note that you're given delta IO3 minus, you're given delta T. Do you know what K is at 22 degrees? The way you did it in lab in part one was that you kept IO, the HSO3 minus the same, so this is going to be 0.002 molar, and if you solve, for the IO3 minus, we'll call it X. That will give you the concentration of IO3 minus to make the solution turn blue in 45 seconds. Okay, so if you solve for X, that's going to equal the IO3 minus concentration to make the solution turn blue with T equal to blue in 45 seconds. And if you did it this way, the answer was 0 0.0061 molar. So the answer to this question was that IO3 minus is 0 0.0061 molar, HSO3 minus is 0 0.002 molar, and the temperature conditions are the temperature which is for this rate constant, that's 22 degrees. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do this Okay, so the second way to do this is to use this equation. Assume that IO3 minus is 0 0.02 molar, HSO3 minus is 0 0.002 molar. Assume that these two are the same and then solve for K. Okay, so if you solve for K, You would get, uh, let's see, if you solve for K, I got 0 0.183 molar to the minus one seconds to the minus one. Now note that K changes with temperature. So once you know K, then you have to figure out, uh, you have to calculate the temperature uh, of this new K value, you can do that using the Arrhenius equation. So if you have, uh, based on this equation here, take the natural log of both sides. Anyway, this is in the textbook in chapter 15. If you use this equation, the natural log of K, it's K2 over K1 is equal to EA over, let's see, EA over R, 1 over T, 1 minus T2. Okay, so if you say that K1 is 0 0.60 and T1 is 22 degrees, in this equation you have to use degrees Kelvin. Okay, so this is 22 plus 273 or 295. Uh, K2 is 0.183, then you solve for T2, and that'll be your new temperature. Okay, so if you do it that way, the new temperature is 246 degrees Kelvin. So, the other way to make the solution turn blue is use this temperature and then your IO3 minus concentration is 0 0.02 molar and your HSO3 minus concentration is 0 0.002 molar. Okay, so those are the two, two uh, I'll say the two 
more straightforward way to do it. This way involves the fewest calculations. This involves one more calculation. There's other ways to do it. You would, you would change the concentration of HSO3 minus and IO3 minus and change K, but then you've got to do more calculations. Okay, and for part D, which mechanism best fits the rate law? So it'll be mechanism B. Now, for a mechanism, okay, so the rate law tells us something about the reaction mechanism. So in this case here, note that the rate law for the iodine clock reaction is first order and IO3 minus and first order and HSO3 minus. This tells us that in the reaction mechanism that the rate determining step has to have one IO3 minus and one HSO3 minus in it. Okay, so the rate determining step has one IO3 minus and one HSO3 minus in it. So when you look at the three mechanisms, the only mechanism which has IO3 minus and HSO3 minus as reactants is mechanism B, and that would be the first step in that mechanism. Okay. So for mechanism B, the first step shows IO3 minus plus HSO3 minus, and that gives the products IO2 minus plus HSO. HSO4 minus. So note that this has one mole of each, uh, each ion, therefore that must be the mechanism. This is also the rate of turning step. Love it. Uh, so if it was, so when we're looking for the rate of turning step, we're looking at the order. Yeah. Yeah, so for example, let's say if it was. Let's say if the rate law showed it was K times IO3 minus times HSO3 minus squared, that means the reaction mechanism for the rate determining step would have a 1 IO3 minus plus 2 HSO3 minus to make the products. So, these numbers here have to match the order of the reaction. Okay, so as we mentioned in class a few weeks ago, reaction mechanisms are very important because it allows us to not only understand how a reaction or process occurs, it also enables us to design, hopefully, better substances, for example, the pharmaceutical and biotech industry spends a lot of research, energy, money trying to figure out the mechanism of how a drug works because if they can do that, then they can design better drugs. Okay, are there any questions on question four? Okay, so if you didn't do as well in the exam as you wanted to, note that exam one, <coughs> as well as exam two, is only worth 10% of your overall course grade. And you have many opportunities between now and the end of the semester to convince me how well you understand the topics and concepts because of the 10 this semester. If you didn't do well, I'm glad you did well. That means that you still have that 
opportunity, I hope, at the end of the semester not to have to take the final exam if you continue to do well in Kim one eight this semester. Rondo. Uh, you said so there's two exams, which of the two is a uh, more difficult? Uh, I don't know. I guess it depends on on the I don't know, since we're doing some graphs. <laughs> Here's a graph you can look at of okay, so work versus performance, or work versus your grade. What about a graph for your students? As far as the duration of the semester for one week and the overall grade and average? Well, I've said so far that, that for and Chem 1B, so if this was, so you're saying we're, we're plotting yeah, time, time versus grade? Yeah. On exams. On exams, okay, so this is exam one, so if exam one was at this point, and exam two is at this point, then I guess you should also include the final exam here too. Uh, I don't know, it sort of varies. Sometimes it goes up, and it's probably there's only three data points on there, so it's hard to say with just three data points. So I shouldn't do this because this is not. <laughs> <laughs>